Dear colleagues, uh, members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed my very first visit here in Tehran, in Iran. And uh, you see, we brought rain with us from, from Germany as a first gift of the renewing of our relations between Germany and Iran. Your presence, just as my visit, testifies to the hope created by the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action negotiated between the E3, Pra 3 and Iran to end the protected conflict over Iran's nuclear program. This conference thus marks a promise, just as the nuclear agreement, the promise of an Iran that will finally realize the potential of its resources, be they natural or human, of an Iran that acts as a constructive member of the international community. Hope and promise, however, are both very well, but they are not sufficient. We Germans are great fans of the game of football, and I know many Iranians are too, so let me share a piece of wisdom with you from one of Germany's great football philosophers. We are saying in Germany, nach dem Spiel ist vor dem Spiel, after the game is before the game. In spite of our shared satisfac satisfaction over the nuclear agreement, negotiated over more than 10 years and during many long days and nights in Vienna, Lausanne and other places, this saying applies to the GPOA as well. Yes, we have produced a thorough and far-reaching agreement, and yes, this agreement has already overcome some important political hurdles in the United States, and here in Iran. But today, on the eve of Adoption Day, it is important to remind ourselves that the real challenges still lie ahead. As we all know, trust is a crucial category in international affairs, as, as in all human matters. Many of the debates and negotiations between Iran and the international community revolved about this question. Is it even feasible to come to an agreement in the absence of mutual trust, was one of the questions. You cannot order trust by decree. You cannot produce it in the market. Trust is a precious commodity. It must grow over time. It needs to be underpinned by real actions. The glaring lack of confidence on both sides forces us to elaborate meticulous mechanisms in the agreement based on close monitoring and strong verification. The fact that we got there in the end shows that cooperation and agreement are possible. It was possible because we didn't take an initial no for a final answer. And there were many no's along the road, you remember. These negotiations required stamina, something Javad Sarif and others in this room, like Helga Schmidt and everyone else involved, had to prove over 12 years, and we should thank them for it. Still, most critics and opponents of the agreements of Vienna focused on the question of confidence. How dare you make a deal with the other side? You cannot possibly trust them. Not only in our domestic audiences we face criticism, other players in this region called this agreement insufficient at best and dangerous delusion at worst. And I'm well aware that also here inside Iran there are some very blunt and harsh discussions about this agreement. You, Jafat, had to endure much criticism. Our best argument today to counter this doubt is to say our deal is designed to work even in the absence of trust. In times when states are collapsing and the international order is in turmoil, this is no small achievement. To negotiate and sign and ratify a treaty that helps to peacefully settle a conflict that had often been on the verge of war. 
Yet again, this is only the first step. Now there is an opportunity to build on this agreement, to build confidence step by step, being with you here in Tehran today on the eve of, of Adoption Day, I sincerely hope that Iran will seize this opportunity by, first of all, implementing its side of the GPOA, by remaining committed to the spirit of Vienna, the spirit of diplomacy, not a work of wonder, but the product of patience, skills, and courage, and by doing its share to address the conflicts haunting this region. We consider the agreement to be an opening for further diplomatic endeavors. This region needs more diplomacy, not less. We are here today because we want to explore the opportunities, but also the hurdles for such a broader regional diplomatic effort. Is there a way to carry the momentum of Vienna forward to resolve some of the hot conflicts of this region? Can we put it to use in addressing some of the underlying tensions of the region that feed into these conflicts? That will be anything but easy. I have no illusions about how much it will take. Courage and resolve creativity, and time. Just take our own gathering today. You are a truly distinguished group that has assembled here in Tehran today, but there are also some missing. Some missing that should have, seat, that should have a seat around this table to discuss exactly the issues we have on our agenda. It is, again, a matter of trust. The purpose of my trip is to explore the political path to end the bloody conflicts that tear apart this region. Conflicts that continue to cause terrible human suffering and that drive millions of people from their homes, more and more of them seeking shelter and refuge elsewhere, including in Europe. We look at Syria, we are over 250,000 people have died and over 12 million have lost their homes. We have seen further escalation in recent weeks with the Russian airstrikes. This intervention has set back the efforts of the international community to forge a united approach by the major international and regional stakeholders. We should use the opportunity of this conference to discuss the fallout of these actions and the possible way forward. There is also the dangerous and bloody conflict in Yemen. There is Iraq and there is Afghanistan, all of which raise similar questions. The answers are not easy to find and even more difficult to put into practice. But what is clear to me, and this is why I chose to begin my trip to the region here in Tehran, we need and we are ready to discuss these questions with Iran. We want Iran to play a constructive role in the international community and toward its neighbors in the region, and this absolutely has to include Israel. In the best of all cases, Iran can become a responsible partner in solving these crises. Some guests in this room will doubt this, perhaps, and many more outside of Iran doubt it too, it is up to Iranians to prove them wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I know full well peaceful solutions never depend on one player alone. And that is why my voyage does not stop here. I have the privilege of a direct flight connection to Riyadh, and I will make use of that tomorrow. Of course, not everything just boils down to the conflict between these two capitals. Theories of proxy wars are popular, I know, but they do not alone explain the sheer size and complexity of the conflicts we are facing in the region. The emergence of large-scale terrorist actors such as ISIS, Daesh, 
that simply decline to negotiate show the limits of diplomacy these days. And yet, we need to act, and we need to act diplomatically. I do not want to elaborate on the long and painful history of inner European strife and conflict. I will spare you the details of the 30 years war and the two world wars and the cold wars in the last century. You have studied all that, and we all know that history does not repeat itself, but, but plus recent events in Ukraine have sadly shown that Europe has its very own regional security challenges. The only little lesson from our European efforts that I would like to suggest today is this. Agreeing on certain basic principles and processes can pave the way for structures of collective and common security. Confidence building measures work slowly but steadily. They take time and they need constant investment. But in the long run, they can provide greater security for all concerned. They work better than attempts to increase one's own security at the expense of others, usually setting into motion an arms race that is risky, dangerous, and diverts precious resources needed for economic and human, human development. Looking at Iran, Looking at the region and the region and its conflicts, looking at the threat of terrorism, I'm convinced that serious efforts by the major regional players to build up trust, a trust that clearly does not exist today, is the best way to go for all involved. It is the pragmatic thing to do. It is also the wise thing to, thing to do because in times of eroding international order, each actor in this region has a responsibility that goes beyond national interests and that nobody from the outside can fill in for. In the end, I believe this responsibility is more existential even, that, even than national pride and ambition. I am fully aware this will be a difficult enterprise. There are many questions, question marks regarding Iran's intention and the reason and plenty of suspicion, some of which might seem unfair and unfounded. We fully accept that Iran has legitimate security concerns of its own. But you should be aware of those question marks and you should not ignore but address them constructive, constructively. To end, my esteemed Indian colleague, Sushma Swarai, once said to me, there are no full stops in the grammar book of foreign policy, only commas and question marks. Even the nuclear agreement was only a comma. And our meeting today is a great opportunity to look at the question marks. I'm looking forward to our discussion and the opening remarks of Javad. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Tell us, if you could, what, from the Iranian view, needs to happen so that peace in Syria becomes possible. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A very good morning to all of you, and let me first of all uh, begin by welcoming uh, everybody to the Islamic Republic of Iran, to a rainy Tehran, which doesn't happen too often. <laughs> and we're happy that you brought some rain for us. Uh, I hope that this can continue uh, while we suffer from lack of rain uh, in, in Iran and have in, the, in this region for some time with disastrous environmental implications. Uh, which incidentally is an issue that can bring us all together because our environment in this region uh, requires a lot of common effort by all of us to, to address. Uh, let me begin uh, by just making a few remarks. I wanted to devote most of this time 
to to a dialogue uh, with with all of you, uh, or at least with some. Uh, but 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 let me just make uh, in the spirit of uh, just uh, continuing what uh, my dear friend and colleague Frank Walter just mentioned uh, some thoughts about what lies ahead and the question marks that need to be addressed. I think uh, the reason we were able to reach a, an agreement of historical proportions in Vienna was that we decided to have a different look uh, at the question and at the paradigm that was uh, basically motivating our efforts for the past many years. We can look at international relations in the old Cold War mentality of a zero-sum game. That is, any gain by the United States and the West is necessarily a loss for the rest of the world. And any, uh, bec because some people have started or have become accustomed to calling the West as the international community, whereas we in the developing world see it otherwise. Uh, and any loss for the United States is a gain for us. And that's one way of looking at it. And that has been the prevailing way of looking at it, that there is no commonality of interest, even in small areas. Uh, and experience has proved that this was actually the case, unfortunately. That in most cases, they defined their interest as hostile to the interest of the developing world. And the outcome was that that mentality prevailed, that nothing could be done. If you look at our history, it's not that bright, neither in Europe nor elsewhere. We haven't been able to resolve conflicts through negotiations. In each and every episode that we look at, we tried all the wrong options before we got to the realization that we needed to sit down at the negotiating table and try to discuss and negotiate a solution. In most cases, all the wrong options included war, unfortunately. The only difference that this nuclear case has is that it didn't include war. But it, didn't mean, it doesn't mean that we didn't try all the wrong options. We did, actually. Pressure imposition on Iran continued for, what, 12 years, 10 years? All sorts of sanctions were imposed on Iran for 12 years, for 10 years, 8 years, some for 35 years. None of them were, were able to produce any result. People believe that sanctions and pressure can bring people to the negotiating table. But our German friends and our French friends and our British counterparts know better than anybody that Iran was at the negotiating table in the early 2000s. We were negotiating. So there was no need to bring it onto the negotiating table. Actually, in 2005, the country that prevented these negotiations to reach a conclusive result is not present in this room. And uh, thankfully, it's not even that administration is present in Washington. It's the same administration, it was the same as administration whose supporters continue to try to torpedo our nuclear deal. So what is it that we need to do? And what is it that we decided to do? Iran decided that showing to the rest of the world that its nuclear program was exclusively peaceful was not necessarily a concession that we were making to the rest of the world. Although we believed that the allegations were unfounded, although we believed that the pressure on Iran was unjustified, 
but we did not see, we did not define for ourselves a resolution of this issue to be a concession. I believe at the same time our European friends need to understand, and they understood this so that we could have an agreement, that getting rid of the sanctions is not a concession, because sanctions were not an asset to begin with. Sanctions were a liability. And that enabled us to move forward, and what enables us to even move further forward is to understand that we need to look at this as a positive sum game, otherwise we will all lose, as we have in the last 10 or 15 years. How we can move from this starting point to address regional issues? We need to understand that this region has common problems, has common threats. Resolving these common threats and common problems is not going to be a liability for anyone. If any of our friends in the region started to believe that ISIS, Daesh, or extremism of any type or color could even be a, a short-term asset for them, they found in a rather harsh way that Daesh was no asset for nobody. And I think they have all waken up to the bitter reality that in this region and in this world, we cannot have security at the expense of insecurity of others. We cannot have prosperity at the expense of deprivation of others. And I think by bringing that home, we can in fact use the nuclear agreement to resolve the problems in this region. Some of our friends and neighbors in this region and some other actors and players saw the nuclear agreement as a threat because they believe that securitizing Iran, showing Iran as a security threat to this region was an asset for them. It helped them explain all the inexplicable policies that they have followed in this region from the creation of uh, Al-Qaeda, to the creation of Taliban, to the creation of Daesh, and to other very negative implications. I, I just left out the part about arming Saddam Hussein to his teeth so that he could bomb Iran for eight years, who could, so that he could use chemical weapons in Iran for eight years. So my question to all my friends is, who needs to get the confidence of whom? Did Iran invade any country in this region? Did Iran use chemical weapons against any country in this region? Did Iran play any role in the creation of Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, or Saddam Hussein in this region? Or were we the victim of all of it? We all need to look for, at in, in the future. We should not remain prisoners of the past. But if we were to remain prisoners of the past, the Iranian people would have a lot to say. A lot to say to a lot of people in this region and in Europe. But we live in this region. We need a stable environment. We need a stable neighborhood. We do not have the luxury of continuing to securitize our neighbors where their insecurity will be our ins insecurity. In Iran, we believe that if Saudi Arabia is threatened, it is as if we are threatened. If there is a bombing in Saudi Arabia, as there was last night, it threatens our security. If there is a bombing in Kuwait, it threatens our security. If there is insecurity anywhere in this region, you cannot, in today's world, live in an unsecure environment and believe that you can be secure. We understand this, and that is why while we cannot forget the past, we will not remain imprisoned in the past. We are willing to look forward. We are willing to look forward to resolve these issues. We believe that all these problems in our region have a solution, provided that we don't look at it in zero-sum games. Unfortunately, what has happened in our region is that some of the players in our region believe that there was a disequilibrium. A 
equilibrium created by the fall of Saddam Hussein, a disequilibrium created by the Arab Spring or the Islamic Awakening, however you want to call it, a disequilibrium created by the fall of the Taliban and the, and the new government in Afghanistan. So they tried to sort of rebalance that disequilibrium because they believed in the zero-sum approach to this. But now we find ourselves in a negative sum situation, in a lose-lose situation. Instability in Syria, instability in Iraq, instability in Afghanistan doesn't serve anybody. Actually, those who were one way or another culprit in this instability find themselves the first targets of this, as the unfortunate bombings last night showed. How can we go about doing this? We need to find the reality that we need stability in Syria. We can find stability in Syria by accepting that there won't be a military solution in Syria. By accepting that military victories have cycles. Today, one side has the upper hand, tomorrow it will be the other side. And if each side is looking for a military victory in order to come to the negotiating table, we will be fighting for eternity. Because there won't be any moment where both sides are, on the, uh, are feeling victorious if we look at it from this zero-sum perspective. So we need to change our outlook. We need to know, understand, realize, and accept the reality that there won't be a military solution. There has to be a political solution. The political solution has to be acceptable to the Syrian people. People outside Syria can only facilitate Syrians reaching that solution, not dictate. We cannot dictate for the Syrian people. We cannot decide for the Syrian people who should govern and who should not govern them. But we can help the, Syrians people, the Syrian people to achieve a political framework in which they can be assured that the future of Syria will be decided by the Syrians themselves. I think all of us have a common interest. Now, Europe is facing this problem firsthand through the migration of these new wave of refugees, which is, a, which is a crisis. We are used to this crisis. We are host to 2 million Afghan refugees. This year, we had 350,000 illegal Afghan students going to our primary and, and secondary schools. So for us in Iran, it, it, it's, it's not news to us. But it, it brought this issue to home for some of our European friends. Doesn't mean that Europe became interested in this issue only because of refugees. Now, Germany was interested in this issue. I've discussed this with Frank Walter even before this became a problem. But now this issue has driven the problem home. It is in the interest of all of us to bring this humanitarian nightmare to an end. And we all need to realize that in bringing this humanitarian nightmare to an end, everybody needs to be flexible, as we all were flexible in resolving the nuclear issue. And everybody has to redefine the problem. The problem in Syria is a problem that needs to be redefined. And unless we are able to redefine this problem in a non-zero-sum mentality, in a different paradigm, then we will be able to resolve it only after we redefine the problem. Iran is ready to play its role in this process, and we will participate actively in any political solution to Syria, to Yemen, and to other hotspots in this region. Thank you. Let me remind you that those of you who wish to raise a question or offer a comment, put up your nameplates so that I can see that and, and call on you. Um, uh, but before we do that, and before I also turn to the Foreign Minister of Lebanon, let me try to push both of you further a little bit and, and, and first ask you a question, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, Frank Walter Steinmeier, recently said, and this is my own English translation, he said, yes, it may be true that for Syria there will be no ceasefire without Assad. But no, he said, there can be no political future for Syria with Assad. Now, is he wrong? Uh, wait a minute, let me ask the question of Frank Walter also, and then you, you answer. My question to you, the German foreign minister, is this. You said, 
excuse me. Uh, you said um, last week that we want and we need Iran to help reach a political transition in Syria and, of course, a de-escalation of the war. Based on Iran's current approach, is Iran, in your view, still part of the problem? And how can it be part of the solution? So you're first. Do you want to start a fight? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I think what we need to do is to focus on institutions, procedures, and guarantees and allow the people of Syria to focus on individuals. What has kept this conflict going for the last several years has been everybody focusing on individuals rather than on procedures. We can all agree that we need to end the violence in Syria. We can all agree that we need to bring all the Syrian refugees back home. We can all agree that we need to all cooperate together in order to fight extremism and takfiri violence in, in, in Syria. We can all agree that in the future of Syria, the Syrian people will need democracy, will need respect for minority rights, will need respect for the rule of law, and will have to determine their future by themselves. We can all agree that the outside forces, both in the region as well as those outside the region can influence the process by facilitating dialogue, not by dictating dialogue. I think we can agree on all of these. Now, on individuals, my uh, proposition is let's ensure the mechanisms. Let's ensure that in the future of Syria, people will not be intimidated to vote one way or the other. Let us ensure that in the future of, this, of Syria, the power will be reformed so that it will not be, all of it, monopolized by one office and one institution. Let us make sure that in the future of Syria, all Syrians have a say. Let us ensure that in the future of Syria, people will resolve their difficulties through the ballot box and not with, with guns and, and, and uh, ammunition of whatever type. If we can all do that, then we can allow the Syrian people to decide and spare us of this unnecessary fight. Who should be in Syria in the beginning? Who should be in Syria at the end? Let us deal with realities and let the Syrian people decide about their future. Unfortunately, there is a need for military fight against ISIS on the one side. But um, I think nearly everybody is convinced that we have to start the political process in parallel. And to <coughs> describe the complexity of the Syrian situation, I'm using this quote, there will be no ceasefire without uh, Assad, there will be no future, uh, there, there will be no future in Syria with Assad. I'm, I'm using this quote the sentence from somebody who is very experienced in Syrian affairs. And um, I know that this dilemma, this complexity is not only a question, this is not only a question for the Syrian opposition. I think this is the same dilemma in which we are acting at the international community. Starting the political process doesn't mean we are starting this process somewhere in the future. Time is running, and I'm sure we have to act as long as the political institutions in Syria have not collapsed. When the process of collapsing is starting, I think the fragmentation of Syria is unavoidable as a next consequence. So therefore, and that was, you know, my sentence. Every meeting when we were meeting in the General Assembly in New York, we have to start now. Even if we are not able to show the complete picture for a possible solution for Syria, but we have to act now, starting the political process and starting to go the first steps for a political transformation in Syria. The, the role of, um, of Iran, Wolfgang Ischinger was, was asking, 
can Iran play a constructive role? The simple answer is Iran has to play a constructive role because we all know without Iran, I think we will not reach a political solution for Syria.